Welcome to Level with Emily. This episode features a conversation with composer Jason Graves about his music for Moss Book 2. It's a VR game, just like the first Moss was, and it's adorable. You help a little tiny mouse named Quill to save her world from evil. And it's uh, as adorable as it sounds. The art is beautiful, and the music is beautiful too. And it's full of solos from, you know, oboe, English horn, flutes, all kinds of flutes, penny whistles, cello, bass clarinet, uh, and more. It's absolutely fantastic and full of wonderfully melodic themes. So Jason and I talk early on about Quill's theme in particular, which I find reminiscent of English folk songs and melodies. I uh, just shockingly say it's Mixolydian mode, even though I know it's Dorian. So I just want to correct that grave error for this former music theorist. My theory professors would be so (laughs) disappointed. So anyway, I just wanted to correct that error, Uh, but leave it in because the conversation's worth hearing. Anyway, it is always fabulous to hear Jason talk about his music, and I loved hearing him talk about, you know, his instrumentation choices for this version of Moss, Moss Book 2, and other compositional choices that he made to create the music for that world. Join us on Discord. Link is down in the show notes. Uh, it's free. And we like chatting about episodes and other things, music-related and and cat and dog-related and whatever. <laughs> All kinds of fun stuff on Discord. Uh, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you're able to support us financially on Patreon, that would be amazing. Patreon.com slash level. All right. Other important note about the YouTube videos. We don't put music in here. So if you want to hear Jason's music, you must listen to, well, you could listen to his soundtrack or play the game, but you could also hear it in the context of this conversation by listening to the audio podcast. And you'll find that wherever you find your podcasts. All right. Well, here is Jason Graves. I think it's important for people to understand that Moss is a, a VR game. Yes. And it's, I think, probably one of the best candidates for, like, won't make you sick VR game, which is kind of <laughs> saying something. Because I do have some motion sickness issues, and I've played it a lot, and it's never bothered me. But it's because of the perspective. And this is why I think it's important for listeners to understand the, the player's perspective in the game. It, it's literally, I'm sitting here at my desk at the studio, and if I put the VR goggles on right now, it would look like the world of Moss is sort of just out of reach, like down on the ground. You're sort of in this, like, sitting on your knees perspective in a forest or inside a castle or Mm -hmm. wherever the game is at that moment. But everything is naturally sized. Like, you are a human-sized spectator. And Quill, the protagonist of the game, is a mouse-sized mouse. (laughs) Now, occasionally, the camera will drop down kind of to ground level and you get an idea of the scale of everything as seen from Quill's perspective. But a lot of the game takes place from that sort of seated in a in front of a diorama perspective. And I wanted the music to do very much what it did in the first Moss, which was convey that that small size of Quill versus the large sort of background that she was kind of following her path against Mm -hmm. and a lot of it just came down to lots of small instruments um solo instruments things that that felt like if i were sitting here and Kristen negus was playing english horn it sounded like she was sort of in the diorama like she was just right over there like just you yep. know, a small, intimate sort of sound with all of the instruments. And I think my favorite analogy from the first one was, it's almost if you ran into a little pub in one of the mouse villages, there'd be a little <laughs> band playing all of these instruments. And this is what they would sound like. Um, yeah. And all I really did from the first one to the second one was we went from violin to cello, because it's it's a bigger story and it's it's a little uh, a little darker and i like the weight of the cello but also oh my gosh i'm such a sucker for cello it, the yeah. the way that i got to write the cello parts um for ren the cellist okay 
I've I've never I've never had a chance to write those kind of lines, and I've never had anyone just respond. Everything you heard was the first take that he sent me, and I would just drop it in. And all the musicians were like this, but um, yeah, the cello was a big part of it, and the piano was the other really big part. Um, I had a harp in the first game, Mm -hmm. which is again a Celtic harp you could sit on your lap. And kind of like the way I went from the violin to the cello, I went from the harp to the piano with the idea of it being bigger and sort of more epic in scope, but still satisfying those pretty plinky kind of fantasy sort of things. But also I could go down low with octaves and reinforce the low end. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That's that was the general probably the general synopsis. I love that you call them plinky sounds. I called them tinkly <laughs> sounds in my <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, they can be plinkly sounds. That'll work. Yes, <laughs> plinkly. Well, yeah, we'll we'll come back to some of those points you just made um, in a minute. But but let's just kind of get out there what what the style of this music is like. So you know, for instance, the main quill theme could easily be like some kind of you know old English folk song or English. Um, yeah. uh, you know, sailing song, even kind of that with the mix- Mixolydian mode, which is mm-hmm. a very folky kind yep. of yep. sound in music. So, um, and of course that theme carries over from the first game, of course. So yep. talk to me a little bit about that and, and getting to spend a lot more time with that theme again. I think you nailed the the style. I mean, it was very intentionally like pastoral and and quaint and folky. Yeah. And that's where you get the, the mixolydian, especially having that flat seven in the harmony really emphasizes kind of the every man sort of like, you know, nothing super special, just doing our thing. We're really happy. <laughs> yeah. And that was kind of the origin in the in the first game. And I never felt like I needed to write a new main theme for Quill or a new theme for Quill at all. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed working with the, that first theme so much in the first game that I just sort of just, co- yeah. I mean, I didn't copy and paste, but I just took the notes and as literal as I could have them represented, like exactly the same way, I wanted it to be just overtly obvious that the theme was being used again. Um, probably more Dorian this time. Which is mm. another mode which gives mm-hmm. you like this uh, uplifting, sort of heartfelt, warm hug when it goes to the major four chord. Um, yeah. I did a lot of mixing modes this time around, especially with that that main theme. Um, a lot of mm-hmm. times I would do, and I know this is a little geeky, but I know you're right here with me. I'd have the Dorian <laughs> happening with the the major four chord, but also the Lydian with the flat, uh, the Mixolydian with the flat seven. But then a lot of times at the end of the phrase, I'd go Lydian and there'd be a sharp 11 in there. And nice. you just, it would, everything would just shift here and there. So it's not mm-hmm. as, you know, um, simple as the first time around. Right. The melody is still playing the exact same notes, but the harmony and the instrumentation underneath it are are like shifting like kind of constantly because it's a much yeah. a much more um what's going on what's going to happen like emotional kind of one two punches in yeah. this second game yeah now of course the first game starts you uh as the player you're opening a book and you're someone is telling you the story of this world and then of course when the second game starts that happens but they're basically just recapping okay this is what happened in the first one, right? Yep. And and I love the the piece of music you wrote for that. Uh, it's called "We Remember You," and you know you got to bring back, you got to kind of play with all of these themes, kind of like, you know, opera composers in the 18th century would, or you know, 19, 19th century more appropriately would, you know, just like tossing in all these themes and letting you know this is this stands for this this. And I I thought that was so fun. So tell me about you know constructing that part. It was. It, it's kind of the equivalent of writing for cinematics at the end of a game that has yeah. in-game cinematics. The, the cinematics always come online at the end because technically that's when they're finished, towards the end of the production <laughs> cycle. And sure. as a result, the composers also finish with most of their music. So working on cinematics as well as working on these book moments like you were just describing was very rewarding because I had already spent the better part of a year and a half building up and writing I mean, I think there's like 20-something actual different 
individual themes that happen oh, wow. throughout the game at various points. So I kind of have them all in my head bouncing around um, like multiple personalities. And when I get uh, a book moment like that with Morla, uh, amazing voiceover for the introduction, reading the book... I can do Quill's theme, and then I think there's a moment where Quill rests her hand, and uh, she's thinking about sort of what's happened in the very end of the last game, and what's going to happen, what's coming forward that she needs to look forward to in this game, and I can play like the textures in a very subtle melody of kind of the bad guy theme, with Kristen Nagus again playing like bassoons and bass clarinets, like really, really low, and doubling mm -hmm. it with the piano and electric bass. All that had already been established, um, and being able to piece it together that way was just sort of like the icing on the cake and musically having it work with the timing of Morla's reading and the page turns but also musically having it stand on its own so it's kind of like I think Stephen um, Stephen Hody one of the two audio people at Polyarch he's like this is like a greatest hits song I love it yeah. it's just all these themes happening and different yep. harmonizations of them and that's honestly what I really love to do is to take that something expected and kind of turn it a little bit. It's mm -hmm. just normally I'm taking things and making them really scary. So it's just yeah. such a blessing <laughs> to be able to do this with major chords and right. you know, some, some extended harmonies and fun with modes and yeah. 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 And there are some fun, like, kind of thematic development things that we're, we're going to talk about a little later uh, where, you know, you're like, using multiple at a time and that I thought was was pretty fun but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute I kind of I have my list here okay <laughs> um and and one of the things that I was why I was asking you about the instrumentation thing is um you know in the in the first game uh, I know these things because of course I went back and I looked at the first game so that's why I keep bringing it up but you know in the beginning um, the very first time, if, if I'm correct, the very first time you hear Quill's theme, you, you hear it on flute. And in book two, you do also first hear it on flute. Mm -hmm. um, but then the first time you see Quill, like in person, like, and you're actively playing, it's oboe. And so I was just like, oh, I wonder if that was on purpose. Like, I mean, of course it was on purpose, <laughs> but I wonder if there's some <laughs> meaning behind that, you know. So tell me, is there? <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. All, I mean, that's really, I'm impressed that you even noticed that. But the flute, it's like the flute was kind of Quill's instrument in the first game. Mm -hmm. Now, the English horn, the oboe, the violin would play that theme occasionally. Um, I would play mm -hmm. it on harp or something like that. But really, the oboe, and Kristen and I both agreed, um, the flute, I'm sorry, was pretty much like Quill's instrument. In the so first game, it was, yeah. Yes, in the first game. So mm -hmm. it was great having finished 95% of the score, getting to score the introduction with all that experience of the second game behind me to say, okay, so what can I do just for fun? Not that anyone but Emily Reese is going to pick up on this, <laughs> but what can I do that would be interesting? I want to start yeah. with the flute and start with the original harmony, but then I want to start changing it because fairly quickly we're getting into like penny whistle land and it's turning lots, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot more Celtic and more yeah. like the whistles are all affected and distorted because the story is, you know, taking a different path than the first game, mm -hmm. which it should. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And that was that was the beginning of the transformation. You hear it in flute, then you hear it in oboe, and I think I think there's maybe an English horn snippet, and uh, it turns to penny whistles pretty soon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. It's just it almost. I was like, oh, it's like quills growing up. You know. I don't yeah. know why it gave me yeah. that impression, but it gave me like. And no offense meant to the flute, but it's like a little, little bit older, wiser, little tiny quill, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Loved yeah. that. Loved that. Um, <laughs> were there other spots where you, where you did that, uh, did that very deliberately? I mean, I'm sure you did it many times throughout, but can you think of other times where you were like, well, here, I'm going to put it on this instrument. You know what I mean? Like a major theme like that? D I, I mean, I think the easiest thing to pick out is what you already sort of hit on the head so accurately is when you hear her theme in flute in book two, Yeah, that's when normally Polyarch would say something like, this is a very, um, um, what would the word, th th they'd say, this is like, th this level should feel like you're going home. Like, we're halfway through the game, but now it sort of feels like you're back home in the original moss. And I'm like, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the, the theme in flute. Okay. And then I'm going to change it and do some other things. But yeah, the flute... 
it's the C flute too. Um, oh. When we can, when we yeah. can do it a little lower, um, it's alto flute in this yeah. game. And yeah. we actually have a lot of bass flute as well, which it was Amazing. basically, I would sort of, I know they're registers, but I would kind of pick out, I'd be like, this would be great in alto flute. And I'd say to Kristen, use whatever she wants. She's like, oh, I'm using alto flute. Because again, <laughs> it's a, it's like a weightier, you know, more mature. Yeah. I like the way you said yep. that. Emotionally and physically, like a lot more yep. mature now. Yeah. 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 And so all of that wind playing was Kristen. I was wondering if it was like, I, I mean, the second I heard oboe, I knew it was her. Not that I, I mean, I wish I could like recognize professional oboe players' sounds in in the way. I just knew, you know, you're just like, well, that's yeah. Kristen because it sounds yeah, great. Yeah, totally. And, um, and and I also figured that you know some of the other wins, I was like, it's probably her on bass clarinet, but I didn't I didn't know that like also flu- maybe I don't know. I just yeah, she's amazing. <laughs> She's amazing. She and really is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I, the the great thing about Kristen is, I I don't need to worry about like idiomatic keys for penny whistles, for example. I, okay. I would ask her because we always have video chats in the middle, uh, before, during, and after all of these different projects because sure. I'm just looking for her insight. But I'd say, well, what keys do I need to stick to for for penny whistles? She's like, I've got all the keys. You write whatever you want. <laughs> Like and, harmonicas, you just open a spread yeah, of penny whistles. And, exactly. It's like, you know, like the guy like opens his trench coat yeah. and he's got like, you know, every key yeah. of penny whistle. Like, hey, come here. I got every key of penny whistle over here. Oh, um, God. And, and a lot of times she would pick like a jazz player, like, you know, someone who's comping a G triad over an E minor seven, right? She yeah. would pick a different key penny whistle because oh. the licks that I had written for her to play were, mm-hmm. were easier and she could do cool little bends and trills and things wow. using a different key penny whistle. And I mean, I, I wasn't keeping track of all that, but she just mentioned things every now and then. It's just, she's just amazing. Yeah. I think no. she played 12 different woodwind instruments in this. Oh total. my God! Once all the you know everything, yep. all the flutes and clarinets and oboe and English horn bassoon. Yep. You said did she just yep, play bassoon clarinet. or was there any contra bassoon in there? Well, actually, I had her double all of the bassoon parts. I had her play them twice, and I took the second one and I dropped it an octave. Oh, okay. So it it sound. Okay. I mean. It sounds just like a contra bassoon, and it's running yeah. in parallel with a regular bassoon. Okay. I did the same thing with the clarinet, uh, the bass clarinet. Oh, okay. So I had a bass clarinet, a contra bass clarinet. Usually those woodwinds, there were six of them. So four of them were in unison up high, and then there okay. were a pair transposed down low, but okay. six independent parts. So it yeah. feels like really, you know. Amazing. <laughs> That's, that's yeah. official music it's the term. Official, yeah, exactly. That's the Latin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a track called The Star Things Way. And, uh, you know, this is, there are a number of times where you get that Irish feel throughout the score. Um, Irish folk music and dance yeah. music and, and such. And this was very, like, Irish real ish you know yeah totally. real r-e-e-l of course um where where you've got all the hemiola like you're going like one two three four against one two three four or like one two three four five six one two three which you of course your mm-hmm. drummer so um and i i loved i, I love that feel from from irish dance uh, and, and all of that but um but yeah so so talk to me a little bit about uh that and the star things way or however you want to Go by. I think I think that was the first combat track that I wrote, um, and okay. I, I honestly in the first Moss, what I really wanted to do in the first Moss is that more Irish, uh, Scottish snap sort of thing. And there's some things like the dia da 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 dia. I've got that kind of Scottish snap a yeah. couple of places from some themes from the first Moss, and I use those this time around, but. Uh, this this time it was pretty much like I'm just gonna go whole hog and and keep everything as much as possible like in a triplet meter, um, the slow music and the fast music because it, it feels like a dance and we talked about yeah. in the first Moss she's Quill's very acrobatic and graceful and does just a lot of her animations incredible and I like the idea of the combat music feeling more like a dance um, to, to reflect kind of her attitude. Because the, the idea is that you're with her and you're helping her in the game as a third party in the game. You yourself, the VR 
like person. She sees you in her world, and when you're with her, she's very confident. So I wanted the music to sort of uh, balance that. And yeah. this time around, it was just uh, no holds barred. I'm just gonna get out the boron, and Kristen's gonna play the tin whistles, and you know, just yep. just just go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and fun to have that be the combat music, right? As opposed to yeah, totally. I don't know any other type of perhaps more generic combat music that mm -hmm. gets written in games sometimes, and you know, it's just is kind of the nature of the beast, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it, what it all comes down to is what the developer wants, because I could have done this yeah. first piece as a fairly overt six eight triple Irish sort of thing and they could have said yeah that's not really working yeah. um but they've never they've never said that um <laughs> i mean of course i'm i'm not just throwing things at the wall i'm thinking really hard and we're having conversations together and discussing what's going to work but mm -hmm. um it's it's a good a good relationship that kind of goes both ways creatively speaking and mm -hmm. i never said I want to do Irish music, but I just kind of kept doing these sort of things. And yeah. at, at some point in time, I said something. Well, they mentioned, I think, Stephen um, or maybe Kristen, the, the other audio person at Polyarch, said, oh, this is nice because it's in 3-4 it's in or it's in a triple meter. And I said, well, all of the music is actually in 3-4 or a triple meter. Unless you're underground in the, like, the scary part of the castle, then it's all 4-4. Four, four. Everything else is triple. And they mm -hmm. were like... Oh, because I'd never, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, sometimes it's just fun to discover things like that along the way. Yeah. As opposed to me laying it all out for you. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's fun, too, that you don't notice that, really. Right? Right, right. I mean, it's it's nice when those it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. This is all, you know, triple. Yeah. No, it's it's fantastic. Um, the Winter's Glass. This is one. uh where I, I well, I kind of want to hear you talk about it. It's very lush, um, gorgeous solo flute, tinkly mm -hmm. piano. There's other like triangles and maybe Glock <laughs> or something like that. Uh, something else in there. Um, so, so I'd just really like to hear you talk a little bit about this this uh, track, the Winter's Glass. You know, you're. I think you're two for two because that's the very first track I wrote for the game. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, the Star Things Way and the Winter Glass are the two the two tracks that I wrote first, but Winter Glass was literally the very first thing, and um, mm. it was it was hard, honestly, because I hadn't established the sound palette yet. Um, I think a lot of people think, you know, when they hear composers talking or maybe they see an interview with you doing with a composer and they said, oh, well, for this, I wanted to use electric guitar and, and banjo and kazoo. And it seems like this, like, super obvious decision. And obviously the composer is very professional and they made this choice from the beginning. They knew exactly what they wanted. And it's yeah. never that way, right? It's always... Yeah. Like, well, I guess I'll try this and kind of see, like, see what sticks. Um, the biggest thing for me for the Winter Glass is that's the first piece I wrote, yes, but it's also the first piece um, that has my my piano on it, my, my grand piano that I have in the studio now. And yeah. I had written it on a VST, on a computer piano, which is a very good sounding piano. It's the same one I used in Tomb Raider 10 years ago, and it's just this solo <laughs> piano theme for Tomb Raider. No one thought it was a, v a computerized piano. They thought it was real. But mm -hmm. yeah, it just wasn't... 10 years later, I'm just not really happy with the computer pianos. So... <laughs> um, Alan, you know, my friend Alan, whom you have met, Alan and mm -hmm. I went to every piano store within like a 60 mile radius. And I had narrowed it down to a Yamaha or a Boston, which is basically a, a Steinway um, built by Kawhi. It's this like crazy hybrid. Oh, wow. And I recorded okay. this piece of music, the Winter Glass theme, um, live just as a single take in one store on the Yamaha and the other store on the Boston, and I took it back home and just dropped it into the mix to listen to it on the speakers. Because they both sounded amazing, but they were both very different sounding pianos, and the Boston just won okay. hands down. Not because it was better, wow. just the sound was what I was looking for. Yep. And that is the piano take that is on the CD. I didn't even <sighs> edit out, like, I didn't edit out anything. So right around 30 seconds when the 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 initial rhythm sort of comes in and there's a piano doing this triple meter thing. Yeah. That is me 
in the Steinway store, like wearing a mask because it was COVID, um, with two mics on the piano and my little laptop, and I recorded just a single take wow. for the for the whole track and all the little do 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 little extra rhythms yeah. and stuff. I, I practiced. I remember driving to the store because it was like an hour away, and I was listening to the track and practicing the fingerings in my head because it's <laughs> octaves, right? Yeah. And you got to do different fingers with your octaves on the piano. Yeah. Because I didn't want to have to comp it together, and he was being nice and not letting anyone else in the store and oh, wow. it was just a great experience and That's whenever so cool. i hear that track now i just think so fondly he was an amazing person the the salesman there at the steinway store and um i love the piano so much and i use it all the time now but <laughs> it's basically after that cue um i got it home and everything else was written every other cue was written on that piano even if it's not necessarily featured the cues were written on the piano and then wow. sort of transferred to, to other instruments. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And so I can see that in the very back. Is that right? Over your, what, left shoulder in the back? Yeah. Over there. Is that it back there? Yes. Okay. Very yes. cool. As a matter of fact, I, if I, I can do it. The yeah. Lid. <laughs> I'm not sure. Can you see it? A mm. little bit. A little bit. Uh, yeah. yeah. You can see, you can you see, can the, see keys. the white keys. Yeah, yeah you can see yeah, the keys. Yeah. So, that's it. It's, it's amazing. It's stereo. I've got stereo mics over there, the wow. same ones I used at the piano store. And I literally just flip a power box on for the mics and I can record. And there's, That's awesome. You can't see it, but there's a screen there, a big computer screen and a keyboard and a mouse and everything. So I can like drive Cubase, awesome. record enable, record. I mean, ev so many cues start with piano. And I literally just sat there and went record. Wow. And nothing better than the real thing. Right? right. Yep. No more computer pianos for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> No, I love that. Oh, my God. Yeah. And again, that track is just really lovely. Um, oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. So Unfinished Business, that's a, a really mischievous kind of feel and energy to this track. Bass clarinet, of course. So that sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. And English horn, all the things. The, just the readiness of that bass clarinet. You know, you can just hear the sound of the wood in that. Re oh, right? So great. So, yeah, I'd love to hear yeah. you talk about that Unfinished Business track. That was one of the underground tracks, so it's straight. Okay. It's in it's in four four, right? It's yeah. like like a doom blum doom like a doom yep. blum. And um that and one other track uh were the two that the the team at Polyarch were like, We need this to sound like fairly different from what you've heard before, because visually mm -hmm. it's going to be a different look, it's gonna be a different kind of gameplay. Yeah. And um that was I think the first underground track I did, and I was like, okay, well, this is not going to be triple meter. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be like slow and methodical. Yeah. And I want to have lots of woodwind stuff. Um, I, I worked with Kristen. I think I sent her either eight or 10 microphones before we started this <laughs> because I knew from experience uh, how hard it is to record penny whistles. Okay. And, and not have them just. You know, they're just naturally very shrill. They're yeah. made to be able to cut across the band in a live performance. Sure. Um, but we ended up picking two two microphones, um, a ribbon mic and a, oh, I think we use cardioid, like a cardioid condenser. Okay. Um, and those two mics together were perfect for the penny whistles. And it turns out they were also perfect for every other woodwind instrument she recorded. <laughs> Um, I kept getting like what you're hearing the 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 bassoon and the bass the bass clarinets have this just woody yep. reedy like wh I mean you can even sometimes like hear the the air like escaping from around the mouthpiece yeah and that's just the detail in those mics um, are uh, amazing and yeah. it made my life so much easier because all I really need to do is just put some reverb on it and yep and, and let it go and just be like oh my gosh that sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I loved it. Yeah, that was great. Um, so talk to me about the, the strings then. Is, is that an orchestra? Did you go to an orchestra? The strings are like half and half. Okay. Um, if, if you were going to play something like the Star Things Way, mm -hmm. the beginning of that, you hear some, I don't know if you if your brain's saying that those are strings, those are cellos Okay. playing that. It's like a, um, like a flat nine sharp 11 chord or something. Yeah. It was like, na, 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 and it kind of resolves. Yeah. Um, but that's me playing cello. <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm not a string player, 
but I can do stuff like that. Okay. So I, I did a lot of multi-tracking, and I started doing this a couple of years ago on some horror games, and it was easier because it's textures, and I can do textures. Okay. But as long as I didn't need to do too much vibrato, I recorded <laughs> as much of the string parts as I could. If you hear like tremolos or kind of like crunchy jazz chords and things, those are probably me playing strings. Cool. If it's like the really soothing kind of beautiful, like with some intimate vibrato, uh, I just had to use um, a VS, like a quartet, a string quartet oh, cool. okay. VST. Wow. Because it was just too, it was too much with all the other live players. Um, we just didn't have time to do more live recording Mm -hmm. because this is i mean it's me and Kristen and ren and um uh uh oh my gosh um yeah my guitar player and i can't (laughs) believe i just blanked out on his name because he's incredible and he does like all this great stuff for me it was just four of us but everyone records themselves in a in a spare bedroom basically Mm -hmm. so it's a lot of kind of producing um, just to make it sound right. like it's all in one room. The recordings are all great, but to get the balance and to have the flute be over here and this over here and do the cello, and it's just, it's very, very, very involved. And um, I didn't have time to do more, unfortunately, with the, with the quartet, which is why a lot of the tracks don't have any VST strings, because I'm just not a big fan of that anymore. Yeah. I would use it in the more pleasing tracks just to do some chords and things but Mm -hmm. you'll you will notice i'm sure if you go back and think about it now that (laughs) it is not the foreground like they're they're just doing chords in the background yeah yeah and the soloists are really what are up for up 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 front and forward yeah Yeah. it's just a texture thing really yeah yeah yeah, Yeah. totally yeah love that uh track called and i might say tillin wrong is it tylen or tillin do you know tylen's domain tylen Tylen, Tylen, tylen's domain um, this is where I heard, you know, themes kind of being woven in in the background um, and stacking onto other other themes. So uh, I'd love to hear you talk about making making that track. <laughs> that one starts to get a little <clears throat> evil, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it gets a little we, hectic. Yeah, we we intentionally sequence the soundtrack um, in chronological order, uh, and as you play through the game, like even gravity starts like messing up and by the time you're at the end which is basically the last uh well tracks 15 and 16 Thailand's domain and torched wings you're kind mm-hmm. of on the the level we called it pinnacle i'm not sure if that's what it's officially called or not but it's like the sky's red and there's these swirling lights everywhere and even quill is like gravity there's sideways walls like an mc oh, wow. escher drawing or something and, and like she can go up there and gravity's upside down and all this crazy stuff is happening and I didn't want it to be, like, really scary, because it's just not that kind of game. But yeah. I also didn't want it to feel as warm and maybe even mysterious as mm-hmm. some of, like, the um, unfinished business track, you know. It's your underground, it's more mysterious and oppressive, yeah. and there's some dark sounds. This is, these two tracks, but especially um, Thailand's Domain is, like, establishing all that crazy up is down weird kinds of things. So Mm -hmm. my first instinct, of course, is, well, how can I take these themes and just make them sound like they're the same, but just something's off? Just like, you know, gravity's still functioning. It's just functioning sideways. So the theme (laughs) is still there. It's just, you know, the the, the theme is in one key and the the rest of the instruments are like a tritone away. So sometimes it lines up and sometimes it doesn't. And I got into the really affecty penny whistles by then as well. Like as we progress in the combat and some of the exploration, the the penny whistles started getting a little less full and more yeah. like radio kind of um, smaller sounding and then some delays on them and things. And by the time you get into this, it's basically just going through a chain of guitar pedals and it's all like weird yeah. delays and everything I could do to musically just portray that kind of crazy anti-gravity like and then other crazy things happen with the story that I don't want to ruin anything but they just yeah. uh, Polyarch really pulled out all the stops on it like things keep happening I'm like really you're going to do that and they're like yeah <laughs> and we need the music to do that too it's like okay great <laughs> when did you start working on on this music 
It was September of uh, 2020. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. A great time of our lives historically. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking. Yeah, I know. It's probably I mean, I, nice I only to have because that. that's when I was shopping for the piano. Yeah. September oh, of 2020. Yep. Right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, so, I mean, you know, I haven't really officially talked to you. Uh, I mean, we've talked, but not on this show. Um, and, you know, what was that like for you? I mean, I, I know that you've kind of got your, your like farm. Mm -hmm. And all of your animals and your family. And you really do have a very lovely kind of self-contained existence. So, um, <laughs> I mean, and I mean that in, not in any, you know, pejorative way yeah, or yeah, anything, yeah. obviously. No. Um, totally. I'm just, you know, how did, how did you make it? How did you make it through all that? Did you make it through it all, all that okay? And pandemic, yeah. of course, I'm talking about. And Of course, yes. Yeah. We... We did. We did really well. Um, I, I joked to a lot of people because that was always the first thing to pop up when you're zooming with someone or having some sort of a call. How's it going? How's the? Uh, yeah. The? And I would always joke that we basically started self quarantining <laughs> six years ago when we moved out to the country. Because <laughs> I used true. to live downtown Raleigh, where you visited yep. and, and slept in the guest room of the studio. That was in the middle of a big city. And six and a half, seven years ago now, we moved out to the country and we're on 30 acres of woods. Mm -hmm. And even like across the street from us, it's a big swamp. And to the left and right of us are just um, farm, like there's uh, um, pumpkins on one side and <laughs> sweet potatoes on the other side. Amazing. And that's kind of our neighbors. Um so it didn't really, and, and we were homeschooling. Now, right. Both my children have graduated since then, but we were homeschooling. So it didn't really affect us that much mm -hmm. other than when we would go out, there weren't as many people everywhere. And it was honestly kind of nice. I would never wish for it to happen because I know why there were not as many people. But um, yeah. yeah, it was it was okay for us. But we were yeah. eh, game composers, music composers in general. We're a bunch of... Just, you know, hide in your dark room by yourself all the time anyway <laughs> kind of personalities. <laughs> and how about the animals? Can Do you mind giving us an update? I mean, is that okay for us to talk about here? Who do you have and oh, what, yeah. what do you got? Yeah, yeah. totally. We've got, um, well, we have less animals. Right. Uh, some reasons are, like a lot of the ones we have just have, you know, three to five year lifespans and that's all there is to it. Sure. And then uh, others, I used to have a whole bunch of chickens and geese mm -hmm. and some turkeys. And I was just having too tough of a time, apparently, with this whole um, thing going on in like 2020. There was also a bad thing happening with like chickens and something, the way the weather, I don't know. Yeah. But it was just, I, I have a friend who lives. 10 miles away who literally has hundreds of birds mm. i mean like she she raises and breeds and sells and does all this crazy stuff so i rehomed my chickens and my geese and my turkeys over there okay to them mm -hmm. and my backyard now i've got two two big flemish giant rabbits and a tortoise in the backyard <laughs> Mr. And Fredrickson, got, yes. Mr. Fredrickson, yep, yep. <laughs> he's he's doing great. Um, still got the parrots. We still have got a bearded dragon here in the studio um, in the other room. Um, my daughter's got a pet dove. Um, oh, wow. In her room. My other daughter has um, a snake, a python, a ball python, super sweet ball python. <laughs> um, you know, we got everything from a Great Dane to a miniature poodle, <laughs> a bunch of dogs, yeah. Uh, I think nine cats, which I guess wow. means 81 lives total. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are they all indoor or do they kind of make their way in and out, the kitties? Uh, exclusive. We've got three exclusively outdoors and um, six exclusively indoors. Okay. But but I literally built a catio for them um, on nice. the kind of the spare bedroom in the back that has this big double door. We just we cut a hole in the house <laughs> and put a cat door there. Nice. And it's like this giant... Um, 10 by 10 by 10 cube with wire and cat trees everywhere okay. and like litter boxes and all that. So they go yep. outside all the time. Oh, nice. And of course they act like they're on Mars if I'm on the deck and, and they're on the catio, <laughs> like their eyes get real big and they're just going, meow, meow. And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm allowed to go outside. Yeah. 
<laughs> you just saw me inside two seconds ago. Stop losing your mind. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, if we can, like, jerk back to, to Moss. Um, uh, sure. Which also is a very lovely little animal wonderland. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, one of the other things I really loved is all the hammered dulcimer. So do you have a dulcimer? I do. Okay. I do, yeah. Okay. How do you tune it? <laughs> Oh my gosh, like it takes forever. Yeah. It's a really, really nice dulcimer. Mm. I got it in the mountains of North Carolina um, oh, years before wow. Moss. I, I didn't even, I, yes, I didn't even have a, a project for it, but I knew I always wanted one. And being a percussionist, it's just kind of like a sideways xylophone almost. You know, it's sort set up of. slightly different, but, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, there's, you know, perfect fourths and fifths and things like that. It makes it easy yeah. to just kind of bang some some chords out. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when I bought it, they gave me a CD and I was like, oh, what's this? This is this mountain, this mountain guy. He's like, oh, that's the, this is the album he recorded with your dulcimer. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> wow. So it's like, a legit professional yeah. dulcimer, so it stays in tune really, really well. Oh, okay. However, it's the it's the biggest one, so it's like a chromatic dulcimer, so you can oh, play in any wow. key. So it's got like tons of extra notes. Okay, and most of the notes are three three courses, so there's three strings on a note. Yeah, um, and you're, so you're looking at you know, 50, 60 notes with three, two or three strings on each note, even if it stays in tune really well, you still need to tune it pretty much every day. And we're talking like, you know, moving the tuning thing, like the tiniest bit, nope, it's sharp, nope, wait, now it's flat, okay, wait, now I think it's good. (laughs) I would only tune it for the keys that I needed, essentially, um, on a (laughs) day-to-day basis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And a a lot of the, yeah, the dulcimer um, is all over the place, the hammer dulcimer, but I also bought a mountain dulcimer for, for this game, okay. which is the three string play it in your lap and strum it. And it's kind of okay. like a, like a slide guitar in your lap. Sure. Sure. Um, really, really cool. I've always wanted one of those. Those, I, uh, the winter glass was the first cue that I wrote and I used the hammer dulcimer and the mountain dulcimer. Oh, cool. Just cool sounds, right? Like yeah. very, I yeah. don't know, mousy somehow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think also folky though, right? You know, it it's it totally very much evokes a certain mood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I liked a lot. Agreed. Um, you know, with regards to the to the music, uh, I think you know when I hear something like this soundtrack, Moss Book Two, I'm like, oh, what a nice change <laughs> from <laughs> epic. Just you know, it's like. We don't always have to be epic. And we know this. There's so many different kinds of games and and all the things. And I've interviewed all kinds of different people. And I love epic music, too, obviously. I don't want to make it sound like I'm not appreciating all the epic scores, uh, because I do. But um, it just just was a nice breath of fresh air. And and you've kind of alluded to that a little bit, that it was like that for you compositionally, too. But I'd like to hear you talk more uh, about that, because I assume that... I mean, and maybe I'm wrong, but my assumption is you had other projects maybe going on at the same time. So, you know, what what was it like? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'll answer the, the, the last question first. And I was working <laughs> on, um, uh, there was a Dark Pictures game out game that came out mm-hmm. last year. I was working on at the time of Moss called House of Ashes, which was horror and yeah. me playing a lot of live instruments as well. Um and actually, that's why I decided not to do live strings for Moss, because we had the budget to do live strings for House of Ashes, but everything started closing. And like, you know, I mean, Abbey Road was closed, Air was closed, Ocean yeah. Way was closed. So I started playing the strings myself on House of Ashes. Just lots of like, like big unisons and then yeah, kind of drop down and I'd record that 10 times in the violins. And mm-hmm. by golly, it sounded like 10 violins. <laughs> um doing you know easy things like that but i was doing that and i was doing fort uh fortnite at the same time and i was also doing um which of course fortnite it was for halloween so that was scary and i was doing lone echo 2 which is this like dystopian uh robot android synth score that was all synthesizers um i think i think that was all uh yeah it's like lots of (laughs) lots of different things and yeah Honestly, that's what I love the most about having them be so different because I could go from House of Ashes, crazy, scary sound design stuff, and then the next day 
do thematic theme and variations, yeah. beautiful chords, lush orchestration kind of things for Moss, which I think is probably my most, I don't know what word I'm looking for. Satisfying isn't the word. Maybe relaxing would be the word mm. type of music to do because the music itself is so relaxing. Yeah. Um, I tend to get like really into whatever I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And if I'm doing a scary cue, like I get all worked up and I'm not scared, but I'm like frantic and yeah. like, you know, very, and with Moss, it's more like the opposite. It would, it would kind of make me relax and mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm going to have a glass of wine at the end of the day while I'm <laughs> mixing this one. This is really <laughs> nice. And just uh, the, the themes and we've talked about that before. That's what I really enjoy yeah. the most is doing themes. However... Yeah. Just like you said, appreciating epic music, I still appreciate doing, you know, textural, yep. dark, uh, whatever. It's it's whatever I can sort of hang my hat on, creatively speaking. Maybe it's just the yeah. mix because it's a pop thing. Um, I was also doing pop music at the time because I was doing this music for limited run, which was literally like oh, wow. 80s and 90s, like Kenny G saxophone and um, <laughs> Weather Channel yes. instrumental stuff yes. um, with all my friends playing the instruments. That's the great thing about games mm -hmm. is, as far as I know, I'm not exactly pigeonholed. I think a lot of people will think Graves, Scary Music, Dead Space, Tomb Raider, yeah. uh, Dark Pictures, and that's totally fine. But mm -hmm. there's another side to the coin where it's like Lone yeah. Echo or Moss 1 and 2 yep. or even like Farlands or some of that other oh, older, yeah. yep. just not scary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's funny that you you kind of lumped Tomb Raider in with the scary stuff because that was incredibly thematic as well, which of course you can do in scary music. So, you know, I'm not yeah. saying that you can't. It's just sometimes themes in scary music sometimes are more textural can be like texture based instead of melodic or something. And there were so many melodic themes in in Tomb Raider, you know. Oh, I, I appreciate yeah. you saying that because I, I'd actually forgotten about a lot of it. I was at Alan's house yesterday all day long. We were just hanging out. It was his birthday, and he kept oh, pulling nice. up songs on his phone to play through the speakers. He's like, "Name this composer," and he'd pull up Vaughn Williams, and then he'd pull up Schubert, and then he'd pull up, you know, <laughs> whomever, and then he'd pull up something from Tomb Raider, and I'm like. Mm, um, like is that hit? No, it's not Hitchcock. It's got this. And then after about ten seconds, I'm like. Oh, that's Tomb Raider. He's like, really good themes in here. And he started playing a couple of different things. I'm like, that's right. I mean, it was like 10 years ago, which feels like ago. an eternity. But yeah, yeah it's no. kind of crazy. Amazing. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, what more do you want to say about Moss Book 2 or just being in that world? I um, I really thoroughly enjoyed spending time with that, with that soundtrack. Oh, me too. I was... <laughs> It was one of those jobs that the whole time I was doing it, I was just think, thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. Yeah. Like, and studying um, just kind of orchestration and a lot of the simple realizations that I would come to, which is simple is better than complicated. Yeah. And just doing, like having Kristen play all these woodwinds, but they're just in octaves or in yeah. a unison, um, or having um, two instruments playing a unison line for two bars, and then they split off and do harmonies, because I'm trying to illustrate kind of the, like the Quill and Argus, her uncle, like their relationship and, mm -hmm. and what's happening in the story. That really simple stuff that I'm not expecting a listener. Oh, I noticed he went from unison to a diatonic <laughs> harmony, and now the, the oboe is playing a counterpart to the flute. I, that's, that's fine. It's just fun excuses to do musical adventurous kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like oh, like me playing cello and thinking, I wonder if I could do that, like crazy chords and yeah. and then just playing more cello, more cello, cello and viola, cello and viola. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's fun. Computers, man, right? Computers, we, man. We wouldn't have been able to do this even <laughs> like 10 years ago. It would have been more difficult. Yep. It's just so crazy what you can do now I know. in your ha house, which is where I am. Right, right. Yeah. Um, are, are you working on anything that you can talk about right now? 
Um, yeah, of course not. Okay. (laughs) It never hurts to ask. That's how I feel about it. Usually the answer is, I can't tell you anything, but it's, you never know. (laughs) All right. I I can say that it's, it's very different from the other things that I've done before. Ooh, I love hearing that. I, I mean, it's also, I mean, I think it's to the point now after 20, however many years I've been doing this, it's sort of like, yes, this project sounds amazing. Now, let's think about, Jason, let's think about what we can do that's going to be really different and amazing for us personally, right. as well as satisfying kind of the creative needs for the game. And it's like the more far out I can get with those new innovative sort of, for me, mm-hmm. innovative ideas or instruments or sounds, um, textures, whatever, that's just... It's just more fun. It, yeah. just, it just means I'm I'm sitting around more often thinking, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I am very glad that you do uh, because it's always hey, too. such a pleasure to, to hear new stuff from you. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear what's next. As always, I feel like I missed some in there. So, you know, I'm going to have to do a little more homework for our next chat and I might bring up some, some things from the past. We'll see. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Sounds great. (laughs) Thank you, Jason. Thank you. 